transactions of the Royal Society of Medicine. <laughs> and they were curious, will Bonobos avoid bananas? Another sleep study. <laughs> So welcome again to our second ever live episode of the Free Associations Podcast. We are... <laughs> Clearly my family is in the audience. Who invited them? <laughs> or that was the Don Thea fan club, I'm not sure, but either way. Thank you all. Uh, now you've totally thrown my timing off and I don't know what to say next. Uh, so. We are here uh, in, at Boston University School of Public Health uh, uh, doing a taping as part of the Summer Health Institute, which is part of the Population Health Exchange. So we've got a lot of students here uh, who are here learning various topics. I don't know all the details, but uh, hopefully we can, uh, we can learn a little bit more. Um, I am Matt Fox. I am a professor of epidemiology and global health, and I'm here with, as usual, Don Thea. Hey, Matt. And Chris Gill. Good afternoon. Both from the Department of Global Health. And we are here, not as usual, in the, we are not in the Godly Studio, but instead we are in the Hebert Lounge, which has a beautiful view of the city of Boston. Uh, so guys, I am curious to know whether you, like me, sometimes wake up in the middle of the night distraught because you know that you love public health, but your learning days are over and you wish there was some kind of a resource hub that you could go to for lifelong learning materials, do you, do, you, do you wake up? Do you, do you have this? I, I've heard about that. Well, it turns out there is such a thing. Ah. It's called the Population Health Exchange, which I think you all should look into. Is this one of those things from the Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health? No, it is not. It's from the Boston University School of Public Health. Oh. I'm oh. going to need to edit that. <laughs> edit those. <laughs> Just take that out. Right. And we're going to dock you a week's pay, Chris. That is the Boston University School of Public Health's resource hub for lifelong learning. So you can find out more by going to www pophealthex.org, where you will find this podcast, as well as many other population health learning programs and tools, and the courses that many of you are signed up for today, you would have found out on pophealthex.org. Uh, so another reminder to everyone, this podcast is available on iTunes and Apple Podcasts and all your favorite podcast sites, so go to your site. What, what, what do you call a, so a, a Grocery is where you go for food. A haberdashery is where you go for hats. Where do you go for podcasts? A pottery. A pottery or a podcastery? <laughs> Either way. Go there to your favorite podcastery and download us. And if you would be so kind as to give us a rating, especially if you love the show. And a, and a review. And a review. We would very much appreciate it. Now on to the show, which I am I'm going to dub our nap time edition, or perhaps the milk and cookies edition, because in our first segment today, which is our Journal Club segment, we're going to look at a study that explored whether sleep duration affects survival. We will see if Don can stay awake for the whole thing. Doubt it. In the second part of the podcast, which is our deep dive segment, we will talk about a proposal to redefine statistical significance. I know you're all excited about that one. And then in our third segment, which is our amazing and amusing, we will get into some of the things that have us emailing each other funny articles or just dropped our jaws in amazement. So let's get into it with our first segment. So our first segment, we're going to get into an article that it got a lot of, of media attention. And it looks at the effect of sleep duration on mortality with a particular focus on weekend, or what they refer to as day off sleep, compared to weekday sleep. The study was published in the Journal of Sleep Research with first author, and it's, it's a Scandinavian name, so I'm yeah, going to do this one. terrible. Uh, Torbjorn uh, Acker, Ackerstedt. Ackerstedt. I, I hope please. I apologize, sir. Uh, of the uh, Department of Clinical Neuroscience at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, study was titled Sleep Duration and Mortality. Does Weekend Sleep Matter? I like study titles that have a question. So this study, as I mentioned, got a lot of, of press attention. We'll talk about whether or not it was warranted. Um, that said, so I, my job, part of my job is to go through and cull all the headlines that, that get pulled on the topics. And I have noticed that uh, all of the headlines seem to use, a, next to the headline is a stock photo of somebody sleeping or just waking up. And I would love to know why they all look so well-groomed in those photos. <laughs> anyway, 
Uh, so let me read you some of the headlines. So the Washington Post says, sleeping in on weekends can compensate for lack of sleep during the week, study suggests. So there, that'll give you a, a taste for what the results may, may not have been. Sleeping in on weekends could help you live longer. Go ahead and treat yourself by sleeping in this weekend, says Men's Health. Sleeping in on the weekends might be good for you, but it's not going to fix all your problems. Scientists still aren't exactly sure how to deal with all your, our chronic sleep deficit. That's from Popular Science. And Teen Vogue says sleeping in on the weekends could prevent early teen death. Teen Vogue? Don't Seriously? you read Teen Vogue? <laughs> okay. You don't read it? I do not. <laughs> all right. Well, and the Boston Globe right here in lovely downtown Boston says you can catch up on your sleep debt on weekends, study suggests. And by the way, one thing I've learned, which I don't normally do, is you have to actually click on the article to get the subheading, which is often where the best part is. So that's, uh, I will be doing that from now on. So Don. Yeah. Can we start with you? Sure. Can you give us an overview of what this study was and what they did and why it's important? Sure. All right. Um, a little bit of background. Um, there's been a fair amount of news uh, recently in terms of the effect of sleep or sleep deprivation and health in general. There have been numerous studies that have shown that higher mortality and morbidity are associated with either excessively long or excessively short sleep. And some of the prior studies have shown that there's a U-shaped um, effect on mortality. So very, very short duration sleep or very, very long duration sleep appears to increase mortality. These authors, however, went through all that literature and determined that all of the prior studies did not distinguish between sleeplessness or excess of sleep on the weekend versus the weekday. They sort of mushed them all together and, and did their studies on that. Term. So they're asking the question, um, since our lives are ordinarily, our sleep lives are certainly ordinarily dominated by our workday versus our weekend day, is there a difference in terms of this association that's been found by others if you disaggregate it by weekday versus weekend sleep? Um, and what they use, these are Swedish researchers, and what they use is something called the Sweden March Cohort, which was established in 1997, and I couldn't in figure out whether that, that referred to the time of year or something else. But it turns out that in 1997, in 1,600 sites in Sweden, they had um, three days' worth of volunteers coming together to raise money for cancer research. And from that population of people, they signed up 48,000 volunteers who they intended to follow prospectively over time um, and relate a bunch of characteristics that were obtained at baseline um, with subsequent medical events. Um, so in 1997, they enrolled these 43,880 43, subjects. And let me just parenthetically say, one of the most interesting outputs from this particular cohort is their report on the lack of association between uh, cardiovascular events and snus consumption. What? Snus? Does anybody know what snus is? S-N-U-S? I've, I've read Dr. Snus's kind of work. Of seriously, there's four people in the audience that have snus? actually five. There, isn't there, didn't you, isn't there a book kind of marsupial? There's a book, The Snus on the Loose. <laughs> <laughs> no, apparently snus is Swedish sniff dipping. Sniff dipping. Sniff dipping. So like the use of s snuff. sniff or snuff, snuff is not associated with um, altered cardiac outcomes. Anyway, really? I thought that, that was great. Wow. All right, so the way they structured this, this study is that they gave all 43,000 people a baseline questionnaire, and it was a 36-page questionnaire, and they asked them a whole bunch of different things. And then for 13 years thereafter, they followed what happened to these individuals and related it back to the answers that they gave on the, um, the initial questionnaire. They had no further contact with these individuals. There were no further questions. So the information that they obtained on their sleep habits was that which occurred at baseline. Um, and they, they, uh, they then, because Sweden is, is linked so uh, exquisitely to all these other databases, they simply sat at their computers and they, they could correlate, they could find out how many people had died, how many had migrated, how many of them had been hospitalized. So they were able to collect a whole bunch of uh, outcomes as well as confounders. They might say they did more than just sit at their computers, but 
Well, they certainly didn't. They certainly didn't like ask questions of human beings and, and real individuals. And, they, and they, just to clarify, they didn't continue to address how how many hours they were sleeping Correct. longitudinally. Correct. They just did that one at the one point at baseline questionnaire. and then followed it for you know right. a decade and change right. into the future. Mm -hmm. Now, of the people that they approached in 1997 to be involved in this cohort, 20 percent denied that they wanted to be involved. So that's already potentially a source of bias. And the fact that all Is of these it? people came. All of these people came together because they, because they were interested in health-related issues also makes this particular cohort of individuals not necessarily completely representative of the entire Swedish population. When they looked at some of these um, baseline characteristics in this population, they found that they were less educated than the general population in Sweden. They had, uh, there, were, there was more overweight or obesity in this population, and they smoked less. All right, so they followed these people for 13 years. They, uh, the questions that they asked about sleep um, were asked at baseline, how many hours typically during the work week do you sleep, and how many hours during your days off do you typically sleep? And they categorized it into less than five, greater than, I think it was nine. nine. Yeah. And the reference point was seven hours of sleep. So the comparisons were those two extremes against, against the, um, the uh, median. And they basically divided the population into, into six groups, those who, had, um, who experienced short sleep during the week, short sleep during the weekend, they called those the SS group, long sleep during the week, week and long sleep during the week, um, okay. end, and medium, medium, short, long, medium, long, and long, short. So they had six categories of all possible permutations. They um, collected information on confounders, including gender, education, um, BMI, severe disease, use of hypnotics, lifestyle factors such as smoking, alcohol, physical activity, coffee. They did the not. Usual suspects. They did not, however, ask anything about mental illness or depression. Yeah, interesting. I wonder why not. During the baseline questionnaire, so that's not a confounder. That's not part of the whole constellation of things that they're looking at. So they took these baseline predictors, they put them into a Cox model, they stratified it for under 65 and over 65 years of age because apparently many, many people in Sweden stop working at 65. Do, um, we, do we know anyone over 65? No, no, I don't think no? we do. Anyone uh -uh. at all? No, no. Nope. Anyone who might have recently turned 65? <laughs> uh -uh. uh -uh. No, got not, it. Nobody, not, Just checking. not I'm aware. Just checking. Uh, all right, so they adjusted for all of those confounders. They also- in Happy the, birthday, Don. Thanks, Chris. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Just three days ago. Uh, so they adjusted for um, all the confounders, including for the week end analysis, they adjusted for short weekday duration of sleep. Um, they did a, um, in, their, in their analyses, they also did a sensitivity analysis where they excluded subjects um, with less than two years of follow-up to try to address this issue of reverse causality because people who, who had less than two years of follow-up might have actually been sick and then subsequently died at baseline. Um, they had the requisite table one where they compared all of the groups and there were some differences across the groups um, in terms of demographics. Maybe we'll get into that. Um, Maybe, a, if little, you're lucky. A little bit later. Um, so what were the findings? All the positive findings were seen in the group of individuals who were less than 65 years of, of age. What they found was that if you had short weekend sleep, Verse, compared to this uh, reference group of having seven hours of sleep, you had a 52% higher mortality rate. So if you slept for a relatively short period of time on weekends, um, the effect was lost after adjust adjusting for weekday sleep. As I mentioned previously, they adjusted or for short weekday sleep. Hmm? Or was it? Or was it? Well, this is what they're reporting anyway. <laughs> um, so short weekend and weekday sleep had a 65% higher mortality, consistently long sleep. So if you slept a lot during the week and a lot during the weekends, you had a 23% higher mortality. However, long weekend sleep was not associated with increased mortality. And the mortality of the groups that were short and medium, i.e. weekday, weekend, and short long did not differ from the reference group. So their conclusion was that weekend sleep did not allow you to catch up. Um, catch up weekend, did, extra, we, extra sleep on the weekends doesn't mitigate does. any, any kind of an effect for does, this. Does, might. 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 Might not. So in any event. 
I was thrilled by this study. Yeah, this was a wonderful study. Sunday night, I did not sleep well, and then I came in on Monday, and I was just exhausted. You didn't have to worry about and dying. I had to read this paper, and I, I was sitting oh. at my desk, and I fell asleep like eight times trying yeah, to yeah, get yeah. away through this well paper. Done. And eventually, I bailed and closed the door, locked it, turned all the lights out, and went to sleep under my desk. I, I'm actually kind of impressed that you even took a shot at reading yep. it. It's not like you usually do. So I read it later. All right. <laughs> I have read it. All right. Before I get to you, Chris, or oh, Don, are you done? Um, now you're yeah, done. are we going to talk about the the, cause the, we'll the, the imbalances in the baseline? We'll come back to All that. Right. So uh, before before we get into your critique here, um, and do either of you have a uh, want to venture a guess as to why you think this got so much media attention? Well, I, w I would I would assume slow, that it, 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 it seems like a like a magic bullet that uh, if you want to reduce your mortality by half, all you have to do is get another two hours of sleep. So it's like this one magic win win situation. There's two no hours way. of sleep on the weekend or the weekdays. Yeah, when I, do I sleep in? E either, like if you could sleep in and not go to work because of your health, that would oh, be nice. that would be great, okay. right? That would be great. Wasn't this yeah. also sponsored by Sealy Posturepedic? <laughs> 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 okay, so I thought so. <laughs> I assume you're kidding. No. So, so can, can Chris give me your give me your critique of, of this study? Good study, bad study, in between study. What do you it's think? A I mean, sleeper. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. ouch. Um, uh, good study, bad study. This I, I'm, I'm going to be I'm going to revert to type because revert to early type. on in our in our podcast history, um, I was getting very snippy because and I had made several comments about like there's certain categories of epidemiologic studies which I tend to just not read because I don't believe them. Um, and I hate to say it, but this kind of falls into that category of where like even before they did the study, I was sort of prepared not to believe the answer no, no matter what the results were just because I don't see how you can possibly resolve the direction of causality. What I mean by that. That is that there's this is, this is a theme you like to hit a lot. I know, but like, not, why, you know, if if someone is not sleeping enough, is that and you know, and there is an increase in mortality. There's an associated increase in mortality. Does that in any way imply that by sleeping another hour, flipping yourself into the next category, that is going to fix that? I mean, it seems like such a a bold assertion when the more likely explanation is that there there are very good reasons why people can't sleep enough, which might be detrimental to your health, and that's what we're really looking at. And I know they attempted to to adjust for that in their statistical analysis, but it's, it just seems like that is a very 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 heavy lift to you know to plug into a model with 10 variables and say, and therefore it's the sleep. And I, I, just, I just find that almost implausible. So Go can ahead. I just ask you, though, to tease out here, because you, 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 you as you say, you hit this theme a lot. You're, I, I think you're getting at two separate things that you're conflating, which is the confounding problem, which is that you may have groups that are not comparable, which is the issue, Don, you're kind of raising. Right. That people who sleep a lot on maybe fundamentally different from people who don't in ways that affect your mortality. In addition to the issue that you're raising, which is the reverse causality, which is, is the reason why people are not sleeping because they're at risk for death, sick. related to illness that puts them at risk for death. And right. I mean, those are two right. two separate right. issues. Right. And I mean, let me let me point out one thing about that because in that in that table one where they're they're comparing across the groups the the. The group in which they found the greatest effect, the group that was having a, a, a short sleep duration during the weekday and weekend, ha, um, had self-reported poor health of 9% versus the highest was 4% in any of the other groups. So this was a sicker group by self-report at baseline. Yeah. So that underscores, I think, part of what you're saying. They were older. They but, reported their health as being worse. They right. had very different um, work schedules. They had the lowest uh, employment. And they had the lowest employment and the, and the highest number of individuals Current smokers who, also. Were, who were unemployed due to il illness mm -hmm. of all these categories. So you're right, but we have statistical methods to deal with this, right? I mean, we yeah, but have that assumes that we capture all of the, the relevant variables. And, and, I, and, and I think why that's should the we point. assume that that's true? Except occupational status was omitted from the model because of a high amount of missingness. Occupational status. Uh, yeah, so they couldn't, they, couldn't, they, couldn't, they couldn't control for that. Occupational status, what's your concern with occupational Whether status? Whether they're employed or not. Well, they, no, they had, they had that. Well, they imputed that if you read the oh, no, method I didn't. section really carefully. I didn't. Clearly, I did not. <laughs> I mean, what's your, so what's, what's, your, what's your concern? I mean, your concern is not, as you say, it's not with the things that they've measured. It's... Well, it may, it may be. It may be how well they measure the things that they say they measured. And it's also the things that they haven't measured that you're worried about or the things that they couldn't put into the model that may make these groups not comparable, right. uh, even after the statistical adjustment, right. such that it's hard to say whether or not you can really draw strong conclusions. Now, I want to be 
I want to be fair to these authors because you know, if you read their discussion, they don't make strong claims. They, in fact, are fairly cautious and say, we, you know, this isn't the, the end all be all. There, there is more that we need to know before we can draw these conclusions. But that's not what gets translated into the headlines. And I think that's where and it that's gets. that's the problem. It, gets, it immediately gets simplified and, term, and like flipped into, and therefore all we need to do is X, and things will be so much because better. Because we want the quick fix. We want right. something. Exactly. Right. Plus, I, you know, if, if there's a study that tells me that you're gonna live longer if you're gonna eat ice cream, then I'm gonna believe it. Yeah. Right? And this is another one. I wanna yeah, sleep I on the weekends. Study. It's so a good study. It's a great study. Gil et al., I believe. <laughs> I didn't eat it all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about, no, okay, so um, I knew, so I knew, obviously, I knew where this was gonna, he, was gonna go because we We've all. We've been there before. We right? all fall into our similar patterns. This is the same thing that comes up when we talk about dietary studies. Um, and the question that I would pose to you is, are we being too harsh? Because these are factors that presumably we believe have some role in our health, and we need some way to study them. So yeah, this is hard to do. It's hard to measure these factors. But are we being too harsh in that, yeah, maybe this study can't tell us exactly, you know, sleep two more hours and you're going to you're gonna live longer, but maybe it hints at there is something going on with sleep that is related to either long or short sleep. I don't Do you buy, buy it. that? I don't no. buy it, I don't Could buy it. No, I mean, one, the other, one, of the, one of the other issues that I have that is difficult, it's similar to some of the dietary studies, and that is we're asked to, uh, to believe that there is this relatively strong association. 50% um, increase. Given, right. given that the, uh, the reported behaviors occurred at one point in time 13 years prior. Yeah. And uh, it, there's all sorts of reasons to expect that th th those reported sleep behaviors ha would have changed subsequently over time during the observation period. So I, I don't have a fundamental level of trust that the, the sleep duration as reported at that one point in time in 1997 is really having this kind of an effect. Yeah, this, mm -hmm. is a, this is really a longitudinal exposure, right? This is your sleep pattern right. changes over time, and sometimes you get more sleep, sometimes you get less sleep, and right. there's no, I mean, I, so one of, the, one of the issues that I have is there's no really well-defined, and maybe it's just the, the amount of space that the authors have, but there's no well-defined hypothesis here. I, I don't mean hypothesis, mechanism here. Right. You mm -hmm. know, what, are we talking about if I, if I, if I get little sleep tonight, I increase my probability of dying tomorrow? Or is this a cumulative effect? What is it that we're, we're really trying to get at? I think part of the reason that that's not specified is because they don't have the data to be able to support any of those hypotheses, and therefore they're, they're sort of just trying to ask a kind of aggregate question. I, you know, I do wonder, though, whether, whether if, if strong conclusions hadn't been drawn from this, whether, and, and again, not by the authors, but by the media, whether we would have as much of a problem with it uh, Given that these, again, these are things that people do want to know about. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you say, Chris? Um, I, I mean, I guess I, I agree with your basic premise that I think the, the media blew this all out of proportion. Um, I, and yes, it's an interesting question. I think as, as, a, as a clinician, um, this doesn't seem quite so striking to me because we, we are accustomed to seeing patients whose sleep is dysregulated in the setting of disease. And so, of course, they're at increased risk of mortality. Or even if they're sleeping too much or sleeping too little, both of these are are, are, are often signs of pathology. So the notion that there is an association doesn't strike me as at all absurd. So if I'm thinking like going through my list here is like question number one, do I believe the association is true? You know, and putting aside the actual statistical results of the, of the study, which in fact only found an association in two of these multiple comparisons. And so I think we could get into the, the you know, the, 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 the basic weaknesses of the, of the reporting, uh, you know, the, the results themselves. But setting that aside, assuming that the, you know, we're just saying is the association probably true? I'd say yeah, probably is true but then the more pressing question is like what is the causal mechanism you know and is this a, yeah. are these just two true you know true true and unrelated uh, one and I think if you want to get a little more subtle I'd like to know should we assume that the, the causal relationships are are equivalent on both sides of these u-shaped curve that is to say are the mechanisms that lead that are associated with an increased mortality due to you know, in, in association with too little sleep, the same as for too much sleep. And, and I don't actually see any reason why that should be the case, that the kinds of things that would make you sleep too little or too, or too different may be fundamentally different. Again, like for example, sleeping yeah. too much could be because you're using too many sleeping pills. And that is obviously a risk for mortality, or right? Or taking, you know, too hypnotic drugs or too much alcohol. I mean, there are many things that could lead that association to be due to the thing that you're doing to make you sleep longer. And I think one of the most important um, sort of medical conditions is, is, is poor mental health. 
that would contribute to disturbances Absolutely in sleep. Absolutely right. And they completely omitted that from. And of course, that is totally you know associated with all sorts of, of high risk behaviors right. in terms of self medicating with various substances, yep. either to stimulate or to suppress sleep. Yep. And so, so that's a huge, your, big black box there that's in terms reverse, of what's going on. Reverse causality. But I would also exactly. say it's also. I mean, sleep is also very much associated with the non comparability problem. That, that the reasons why people get short sleep is often related to their 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 field of work, which can lead to uh, put you at greater or less risk of death. Okay. And we didn't even get, you know, the thing, another sort of big weakness is here, we're not looking at the causes of death. And that would be fascinating to look at. Like if you were to say that too little they sleep did. is associated with like did crashing your tractor trailer truck into a bridge at 3 a.m. because you haven't slept, That's, I'd say, yeah. well, that one might be causal, yeah. you know? So they did actually look at cause specific. A they few, specifically a few said, and I, I, you know, this where, is gonna, this is gonna give me hives here. In fully adjusted models, there was no significant association was detected between weekend sleep duration and cause-specific hazards for cancer and CBD mortality, neither in young nor in the old age group. And then my favorite of all, data not shown. Okay, so that doesn't that doesn't reassure me in the least. No, because why would sleep have anything to. to do whatsoever with cancer? I'm not here to reassure you, Chris. Uh, <laughs> and the reason I say that is. Uh, <laughs> Data not shown means I, I don't know whether they're just saying it was not statistically significant, therefore it wasn't meaningful. You so know, I missed no, that, but it didn't matter that there, I missed that. There's no data. I don't yeah. know. I, um, I want to go back to the one other point, which is that, Don, you said in the beginning, and I cringed when you said it, that 20% of the people invited to be in this study didn't participate, and that could lead to bias. Why? Well, I mean, if that if that particular group is motivated or uh, b because of, of forces that could affect their uh, likelihood of death, um, maybe they're sick, maybe they are just um, you know they they are have mental illness and they they don't want to be involved. I mean, there could be some systematic reason for why sure. that twenty percent denied being involved in the group, and that we w it would be good to know what what the composition of that group is. It would be good to know, but I don't I, I'm not clear on how that's a potential source of bias. I think that's well, a source no, it's, of it's, generalizability. It's a potential, no, yes, exactly. It's not, it's, not, it's not bias. It's really generalizability in the same way that the composition of the original group. And the, the reason that they were all congregating in one place but, from which the sample was obtained uh, alters the, the, the possible generalizability. It, it does. I think you have to be careful, though, because when you say 20% of them chose not to be in the study, well, who's supposed to be in the study? It was people who signed up to be in a, a, a walk to raise money. I mean, they're already a heavily selected population of people. Some of them then selected out of it. There are all kinds of selection forces that go on with almost any study that we do. Um, that doesn't necessarily lead to a bias problem. It can lead to the, comp you know, the lack of comparability that you can then sort out with regression potentially, or maybe you can't because you didn't measure it. But I just want to be clear that I don't think that's a source of inherently a source of bias. It's a source of who do these results pertain to. And if we think that the effects of sleeping are kind of generic, that they are universal across populations, then maybe it doesn't matter. If we think they actually are, you know, the effects of sleeping are very different in people who show up for walks compared to people who don't hmm. show up for walks or people who participate in studies and people who don't, then I think it potentially could matter. All right, any, uh, Chris, Chris well, is raising his well, hand. Well, I, I do. I, I wanted to sort of get at, at the, the biological plausibility because they make um, a lot of uh, of hay around this, the, the differential effect of too little sleep as a function of age. And so really the, the, the increased mortality effect uh, due to a weekend, lack of weekend sleep is in uh, those less than the age of 65. Um, Which, by the way, it was a very small subset of the population that had short day and long sleep. Right. And, then, Three, and that's reflected four percent of the population. Very wide confidence intervals around that 52% increase in mortality, which, in fact, you know, I know we shouldn't uh, say this, but loses statistical significance when they do it. We should not fully. say that. It was but, wide. But I it wouldn't did. say very wide, but they were wide. It's the widest of all these comparisons. It is. So, I mean, the mortality risk goes from 1.15, which is you know, very, very small to 2.02, so which could be slightly bigger. But in it's, it, either case, the, the risk is not particularly great, even with a relative risk of two, that we're talking about probably an absolute value that's 
small. But that's not my point. What I want to get at is... Do we know that? Do we know what the risk of death is that they're multiplying? I think we can probably figure it out here, but let let me not lose my thread. You figure that out. So, but this effect disappears when they go into, um, when when you go into the greater than 65. And it sort of struck me that this might be one of those instances where we could use that, that magical statistical test of regression discontinuity analysis to look at you know, the, the, the mortality differences in those who are three years younger than 65 versus those who are three years above 65, or maybe a bit tighter if you want that. No, because you couldn't. We, why, why could you not do that? To see <laughs> I how, think we're getting a little because in the there weeds shouldn't here. Be, there, there shouldn't be that much of a difference. If this is driven by biology, there shouldn't be that much of a difference between people who are 64 and those who are 66. Yes, I'm going to ignore the regression discontinuity because it's a totally different thing that, that does not apply here. But uh, your, your point is that Somebody just above and below should have roughly similar effects. Right. But I don't, I don't think you're, you're measuring that. You've got above 65 and below 65. So the below 65 is everyone from 30 to you know whatever it is. to. So you're not measuring the same thing. Right. So they would have to narrow those windows to look at the yeah, yeah, just yeah. above and just below, yeah. reasoning that there should be no biological differences. And if you are finding a trend towards some difference between those, it's probably not driven by a biology, but it's much more about sociology. And so that's where we sort of look in terms of like what are, what are the, the causal factors here it's probably not a, a biological thing linked to sleep per se, but rather things that are associated with sleep or confounded by sleep. Could be. I think you're getting an effect modification there. But anyway, Don, did you have a, any last comments before I wrap this one up? Um, no, I don't think so. All right. So I want to end. I want to end with one. Um, as I tend to do, I pulled out a, a sentence from this study that I didn't uh, particularly like. Um, so it says, so it was the first result that they presented, and they said, among individuals below the age of 65 at enrollment, figure two, short weekend sleep was associated with a significant 52% higher mortality rate, blah, 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 uh, compared with seven hours, with a seven hour group, while no association was found for the longer group, greater than nine hours of weekend sleep. And then they say, after adjusting for weekend sleep duration, the risk estimate for short sleep decreased and lost statistical significance to a hazard ratio of 1.4. So a hazard ratio of 1.52, they do some adjustment, it drops down to 1.4. Loses statistical significance. Uh So you can imagine why I hate Uh this. Is 1.4 that different from 1.52? I would say probably not. The statement that they made is factually true, that it did in fact lose statistical significance. It seems to imply that it loses meaning. Right. Which I would say isn't true. It's just simply a slightly smaller estimate with a very similar width of a confidence interval. So what this gets me to is our second segment. <laughs> and in our second what segment, a segue. well, I do what I can. In our second segment, we're gonna talk about a paper that got, it got, it got quite a bit of detention and debate and touched some nerves. So this uh, paper came out in Nature Human Behavior in January of 2018. It's got a very, very long list of co-authors, but the title of the paper is Uh, It's a comment, and the comment title was Redefine Statistical Significance. We propose to change the default p-value threshold for statistical significance from 0.05 to 0.005 for claims of new discoveries. So the idea of this paper, and this was um, a a number of co-authors on this who are in the field of of psychology, but I think people are talking about this in our field as well, so I think it's just as as uh, relevant, and so what they say, essentially the idea is that the commonly accepted threshold for statistical significance is a p-value of less than 0.05. They want to change that to a p-value of less than 0.005 for reasons that we've talked about in the past around what the distribution of p-value should look like for true mm-hmm. findings. And the risk of, of too many false positives And the risk of the too literature. many false positives. Um, and then they want to take p-values between 0.00 5 and 0.005, and now we would consider those suggestive. I don't know what that means, suggestive, but we would consider them suggestive. So they say results that would um, currently be called significant but do not meet the new threshold should instead be called suggestive. And so I thought it was a, a, an interesting paper for discussion, so let's get into it. Chris, 
Are you now, or have you ever been a hypothesis tester? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that, 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 yeah, there are, there are many uh, analogs to that question that I also feel uncomfortable answering. Yeah, answering. I'm not surprised. Um, so I, I suppose we have all good been, idea or bad idea. Uh, all been hypothesis no, testers. No, no, no. This, 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 uh, we have all been. We have all been at one point or time, including yourself. Including myself. Yeah. Um, so the, the the question is: Is this a um, you know is is, is the problem that we've gone the wrong threshold? Well, we'll start off with what's the problem? Why is there a problem with a p-value of less than 0.05 as the departure point for well, statistical Well, it, it's just it is inherently likely that you, many things that are reported that hit that magic threshold of 0.05 are going to be false positive associations. Uh, purely by chance. And so we are, we are enriching the field for you know, chance results that uh, you know, have the potential to send us down rabbit holes in terms of looking for further studies or um, actually driving behaviors or policy changes. And so there, there, is a, there is a risk around using this threshold, which is a relatively easy target. So I, I, I would just clarify. I mean, so the, 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 if you find an associated relationship between an exposure and an outcome, the, so we would call that a positive finding. You find right. some relationship. The probability that that is a true finding, meaning it, there really is some effect of the exposure on the outcome, is driven in part by the, the threshold of significance at 0.05, but it's also driven by the prior probability of that being true. So if we're in a field where we just decide to run a bunch of statistical tests right. on things that may never be true, and the chance that any one of them is really a true positive is very low, then the chance that the it's a positive finding after we find statistical significance is somewhat low. I think it's really important to, to, to put this piece in the context of what the authors were trying to address. And there, okay. is, there is a crisis of lack of reproducibility in the scientific literature right now, such that findings are hard to reproduce. And in part, the argument is because there are a lot of s sort of false findings, that something that is statistically significant at a level of 0.05 or 0.04 or 0.03 could in fact be a non-association, is a false positive, is a false finding. What, the, what these authors are trying to do is trying to address that to a certain extent. They're also trying to um, um, address this particular modification to findings that are new, not findings that are being reproduced, but findings that are sort of paradigm changing or something that is undiscovered or unknown previously. I, so I agree with I you, think that I they're, they're mitigating what, a little bit of, of the effect. I think it's unclear what, what, what it's meant by new, though. I mean, is it, is it uh, you know, only a study that, that would attempt to specifically try to reproduce another person's study that would be not subject to this? Because that's, that's the minority. I, I, that's the way I read what the authors were, were, were proposing. Kind of minority. The, the other problem I have with this is, is, that, is that, that in order to have that threshold, 0.005, will require a significant increase in sample size. So that means that we'll have to enroll more people to have the power to be able to achieve that level of significance. And their estimation is that it's going to increase the cost, the size, and therefore the cost of these studies by 70%, which is, you know, if, if it does what they say it's going to do, that might be a good thing, but that would make doing this kind of research a lot harder because it'll be a lot more expensive and logistically a lot, a lot more complex. If, if I can add to that, so like using today's article as an, as an example. Where the sleep study. The sleep study. So they, they don't actually use any p-values. They use conference intervals. But, yeah. But, um, yeah but, but then they draw conclusions. But then they draw conclusions in, terms of, in so. terms of hypothesis testing anyway. So they're a little bit inconsistent. But um, the, you know, in, in the, the statistical significance reboot article here, reboot. they talk about, about, the, about the use of the base factor. And and interpreting a p-value in terms of an approximate base factor. So, okay, so people aren't going to know what a base a, factor is. A base is, factor so. is, is the degree to which the results of the experiment change your pretest probability of something being true. So let me give you an example. Uh, so let's imagine that you've got two individuals who come to an emergency room with some nonspecific chest syndrome. Chest, you know, chest discomfort, and there's concern that maybe they're having a heart attack. And so you get EKGs on both of these, and they are exactly the same EKG. I mean, that is to say, they show the same things, which is a, a pattern of, of changes on the electrocardiogram that looks suspicious for cardiac stress, like they're maybe having a heart attack. So the data 
are, are identical in those two individuals. That is to say that the EKG is, is, should have the same statistical weight in terms of changing your opinion in both cases. But the question is, what was your opinion before you did the test? Okay. So let's imagine that the, the first patient was a 78-year-old, poorly controlled diabetic with hypertension who smoked his entire life. And now he's got a chest pain, nonspecific chest pain, and a wonky-looking EKG. The question was, is he having a heart attack? And you'd say, well, the probability that he was having a heart attack before I did the test was like 10 to 1 based on his history. And now the EKG moves it up, say, another tenfold. So it's 100 to 1. So we're really certain we're going to put this guy in the cardiac care unit. Okay, So that's the base factor would be a multiplication of 10 based on what you thought before you did the test. Now imagine that the second patient is this 22-year-old Marathon runner. Marathon, vegan, vegan. triathlete. <laughs> you talking about me? Oval you know, vegan. Oval vegan whose parents have both lived to 110. <laughs> right. okay? okay, you're not and talking about me. And lives on a, on, a, on a diet of wheat germ juice. Okay? <laughs> and they come just and come back from running a 45 mega, megathon, 45 mile megathon. What's a 45 megathon? I just, mean, just they, curious. You know, they really stress themselves out. And they have the same thing. <laughs> so you would say, like, what is the probability that nonspecific chest pain in that individual is a heart attack, you'd say it's like one in a thousand. And now it's one in a hundred, okay? But you've moved, you've changed your opinion by the same fold, but the question is what did you believe before you did the test? Sure. And so that is the, the in, in a sense, is the difference between how the frequentists would approach this versus the Bayesians, is the Bayesians are always wondering, like, what did you think beforehand? Sure. And so in, in that, they have basically asserted that a p-value of 0.05 is about equivalent to a Bayes factor of around two or three. That's what they say. I'm, meaning, I, what? I don't, meaning what? That, that it would change your opinion by a, to about two or three fold, which yeah. is not a great difference, right. in other words. So if, 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 you know, and so our, our paper today, um, probably if we did this in terms of p-values, would hit around a p-value of 0.05, because it was just yeah, barely yeah, yeah. significant. Exactly. So it's got to hover the around 0.05. Are, are... And so the probability that this study being true is about two times more than what we believed beforehand, which is a trivial difference. So the probability that isn't true is also very, very high. Sure. So and we believe it even less now. So we believe it even less, because, you know, in terms <laughs> of how much did it really truly change your opinion, the, the answer is in, in a trivial degree. And so okay. the trial, so, the study has actually told us almost nothing at all. Bring, bring it home. Get uh, us back here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what they're arguing for is a Bayes, you know, is to, by pulling the p-value down to 0.05, that you're essentially getting to a Bayes factor of around between 15 and 20, which is a substantial change in your opinion. And so even though, I, I think I know where you're going to go with this, is that it still is, is, I don't know is where I'm go a little log it. illogical to draw a single line in the sand and say, this is good and this is bad, up and below this threshold of p 0.05 or 0.005, doesn't matter what which one it is. Yeah. I think the real value in this and where it, it, it is is that we're actually enriching for clinical associate our clinical meaningful factors that change our opinion in a in a substantial and meaningful way by 10 to 20 fold. And I sure. think that is probably a big advance. Okay. That that would be helpful to me. So you, would I, are you pro then? You, you're I, think the I, kinda, I think I came, came down on the like, I think this is probably no. a, not a bad, I know, I know it seems so. I consider this a huge so, betrayal, Chris. So, so This is not what we talked about yesterday, know, Chris. No, 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 no. We don't like thresholds. No, no. I get that, I get All that. Right. And yet, and yet I think it is, if, if we're living in a, in, a, in a scientific society where, you know, we are all thinking in a very simplistic way about, about truth, through the lens of p-values, which we shouldn't be, but we are, this would be a simple remedy rather than trying to, to teach the entire scientific community to think in a different way about pretest probabilities, uh, which I think is maybe. the better way, but I don't think we're actually going to get there anytime soon. Sure. So that at least moves us in the direction okay. of enriching for truth and eliminating, or not eliminating, but reducing the risk of type 1 errors in our studies. Wow. <laughs> Chris. That's what I think. Chris. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Don, Chris, you, 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 you <laughs> disappoint me yet again. I'm so pleased to. Um, so, you, you, so, so Matt, you don't agree? I'm not a fan. Yeah. No, I'm not no, a fan no, of this proposal. Why. I'm not a fan because I'm not a fan of hypothesis testing in general. So hypothesis testing, the idea that we, we God, set this, this value of point of, what's that? That's sacrilegious. It, it's not that sacrilegious. That we set this value of I mean, point all of All these people are learning about the importance of hypothesis testing right oh, now. Oh, sorry. I apologize. <laughs> Uh, ignore everything I say. Take a nap for a minute. There, <laughs> It'll help you live longer. Isn't there a PHX course called hypothesis testing? I don't think there is. No, okay, sorry. So I'm not a big fan of hypothesis testing. The idea that we would set this, this value of 0.05 and if the p-value is below it, it somehow has some meaning. 
I mean, to be very fair, people don't, don't necessarily interpret it always that way, but I think a lot of people do. It's a bit of a dichotomous disservice. Okay, so it leads to this disease called dichotomania, in which, you know, it's important if it's less than 0.05, but just above, it's not important. Now we have trichotomania. So now it's important if it's less than 0.005. That sounds like pulling out your hair. But we have that now. We have that now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, people, people will report a tendency towards or, or marginal significance sure. or borderline significance and if it's 0.06 or 0.07 or trend towards. You know it makes me apoplectic. Yeah, I know. I, I know. hate that. And, and mm -hmm. this will probably result in the same thing, but just a little bit lower down on the scale. Well, so I'm not even sure that it will for the reasons that I, I think I mentioned to you before, which is I think that all this is going to do is change the terminology. We're just going to start referring to things as marginally significant or suggestive or whatever it is. But in fact, the yeah. media is going to pick it up the exact same way. The journals are going to continue to publish it because unless the journals are planning to considerably cut back on the number of papers that they're going to publish, it's still going to get in there. And the enterprise, the research enterprise isn't going to change. So I don't think it's going to change anything practically. But what I think it does is further reinforce this idea of hypothesis testing. And the reason why I, I struggle with what you said, Chris, which is, uh, I mean, I get your, your argument around Bayes factors, the, the idea that we want to think about how much evidence is there to change my mind, right? I, I buy that. But significance testing is getting at the amount of random error in a study, right? The amount of how much, you know, how much you know, we have a point estimate that we found in our study and there's variation around that, you know, and we believe that there's variation that my finding could just be a finding just by chance. And our, our way of, of testing that is through this hypothesis testing mechanism, which assumes that all there is is random error in my mm -hmm, study. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that, that's obviously too simplistic. And that's wrong. Mm -hmm. There is systematic error. We go back to the study that we just looked at, the sleep study. We talked about all the concerns that we had for why the point estimate might be wrong. If the point estimate is wrong, that's going to shift what, where I'm building my confidence in or around or what my p-value is actually going to be. You can't suddenly determine that something is or is not important or does or does not have value based on a, a measure that has to make the assumption that there is no bias when every study has bias. And so it just strikes me as a bizarre way to think about things, whereas we could just look at confidence intervals around the estimates, not worry about whether it does or does not include the null, think about how precisely we measured what we would measured. I realize it's not satisfying. I realize it doesn't give people what they want, but to me, it's a much better approach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree with you in a in a longer term enlightened vision of the world. This is the way it should be. Um, my question is whether this is a, a practical fix, short term fix, in terms of moving us in that direction of greater nuance, at least reducing the false positive rate while we're at it. I don't think so, for the reasons that I said. I don't think it will reduce. I think we are just going to. I mean, yes, in the sense of. So the question is, when do you determine something is. Uh, a positive finding? Is it the minute you say it's statistically significant or is it the minute you say that it is suggestive or none or of when the Or when the second and third study also show what you found in the first study. So that's the other problem here I have here, which is we don't draw, we shouldn't be drawing result, uh, drawing conclusions based, based well, on the one results experiment. of one study. Yeah. Therefore, we don't need such an approach mm -hmm. that says we have a positive finding or not. And of course, we, we still haven't really got into the whole issue of the absolute values of these differences, which turns out to be very important. I, mean, I was just reviewing something the other day where the authors had said in their summary statement that there was a significant impact on, on linear growth. And when I pulled the paper to look at this impact on linear growth, it said that, you know, this, these People who got this intervention grew at a rate of, uh, I mean, statistically significant rate of 0.5 millimeters per month faster than the other group. So by the end of a year, they would be half a centimeter taller. And you think like, wow, that that may be statistically true, but like, who cares? That is nothing. <laughs> that is of no consequence. I mean, so this is like like yeah. half of a P taller. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, whatever, you know? <laughs> that's <laughs> a good P value. That's a better like, P value. Right and this there. was published in the well, British uh, Medical Journal, so it was, it was no, no sort of like a uh, bathroom rag. It was a real, <laughs> a real heavy hidden journal there with, with a point, point 0.5 centimeter growth per year difference. Wow, okay. there it is. Can I make one last point before we move on? Please no. do. The other issue that I have with this is that it, it is solely focused on Despite the fact that they do actually address the issue in the paper, it's really focused on false positive findings and not false negatives. Right. And false negatives have Are consequences too, right? Yeah. I mean, if, if, if you tell me that eating ice cream does not cause cancer, that's important information because I want to eat the ice cream. It doesn't, right? What's that? It does but if not you tell cause... me that it does, falsely tell me that it does, 
that has consequences because now I'm going to stop eating the ice cream and no, I like I would, the ice I would cream. not stop. I would just not I know it. you would. I know you would. They do actually talk about that in the paper. I don't want to pretend that they don't, but uh, I just feel like it, it gets short shrift. All right. Can we move on? Yeah. Sure. All right. So let's move on to our last segment. This is our favorite segment, our amazing and amusing, where we want to highlight some of the things that make us enjoy our jobs way more then we already do a look at the weird and wacky things that happen in our field or fields around us, those that inspire us. Who wants to go first? I'll, Chris. I'll, I'll go first. Sure, sure. So I, I, I was uh, thinking about weird science that, had, that started with the letter B. B. Um, yeah, B. Letter B uh, or animal B? B, B. Well, actually, animal B as well. So B, the animal, animal B was one of them. Insect. So there was, you know, there's a flurry of interest about the fact that, that there's a study that came out in Nature that says that bees can count to zero. Um, and, uh, and I was like, wow, that is so cool. And it was right up my alley. Then I pulled the paper and I realized I couldn't understand a word of it. About bees? About, no, the, the, the statistical analysis was so complicated. I, I was like, I, it, it defeated me utterly. Um, so I decided not to talk about that one. So you're not going to talk about bees? I'm not gonna, other than apparently bees can count to zero, that, which was in the headline. And so I've provided absolutely no additional information to what you knew before. Oh, this is so out of character for so you, though. You've the, talked about bees how I, many times? I know. Our I love, last I love live bees. podcast. I know. You talked I do about love bees. bees. Um, I'm kind of into bees. But I'll, 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 I'll try to bring it back on a later <laughs> okay. edition. Including the second one was brains, though. And I was, I was really into this, this study that came out in, in World Neurosurgery, a journal oh, that I don't favorite. read very often about uh, trepanation, which is drilling holes in people's heads, like you need a hole in, in your head, like X. My mom always says For what it. purpose? For what purpose? For various purposes. Now, it turns out that the, the ancient Peruvians and later the Incas were masters at drilling holes in people's heads. You're joking. I'm not. And so you <laughs> can learn a lot with, about with this. What? With what? Well, they would use a variety of tools, but usually flint, and they would sort of scrape for them away. For what purpose? Uh, for, well, that is interesting, because <laughs> you can often infer <laughs> the reason that they Isn't drilled it? the hole in the head. And a lot of times, it was because there was like a depressed skull fracture, probably because like someone threw a rock at their head, and, and you know, yeah. they have a you know the hematoma, so they got to drain that. God. But but it, at least with the Incas, the majority of these hole boring things were not done in the setting of depressed skull fractures. They were just done for for funsies, for <laughs> for whatever, for because they they slept too much or something like that. It's like a, a I, party I, trip. I to try to cure longer. that. Yes. Maybe they wanted a window on their soul. Most oh likely, it was probably mental health issues. Is my guess. Yeah. Is that this okay. is treating treating Letting mental out the health bad humors? Uh, bad sure. humors, yeah. Okay. Anyway, the, you can learn a lot <laughs> from the skulls this? because because the if if the you know if you successfully trepan someone, drill a hole in their head and they don't die, the bone will regrow, and so you can see that in the skull that the bone has healed, and so you know that the patient survived, um, because it takes months to do this. So obviously they survived. Whereas if there's no regrowth. They probably did not survive the trepanation. Um, they died on the table, so it was. And you, you have to have a very <laughs> obliging, really wondering where this is obliging going. patient to put up with this, to put it mildly. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's not what you anyway, generally volunteer uh, for. The survival rates with the Incas were up in the 90% range. So it's astonishing that they, they actually got really good at doing this. And there are individuals that they found their skulls who had like five or six big holes in their head that had, were of different ages. And so they'd done this repeatedly, and they had survived them all. It is kind of a remarkable thing. Um, but I actually wanted to talk about bonobos. <laughs> so that's not what I'm talking about today. Time. Oh, I don't even about, know what that transition bon bonobos meant. Bonobos are chimpanzees, but they're not chimpanzees because they live on the south of the Congo River. And so they cannot, they, you know, the Congo is a big river. The bonobos are on the south side. The, the chimpanzees are on the north sides. And culturally, <laughs> bonobos and chimps are very different, as Don knows. Right? You've seen bonobos. Yeah. They're delightful, whereas yeah. chimps like, will bite and eat your face. Why, why, you know? why does Don know? Because he, he lived in Zaire. When, I was, when he, I was in the Congo for three years, there was, yeah, there were, there was a pygmy chimpanzee colony right next to okay. us. Is this going to relate back, back to the skull thing? I don't know I, where, I don't where he's going. Where are okay. you going with it? How well, many papers are you going to report Just two. Yeah. Just this, this one. This is the last one. I got a third one in there. I didn't say anything about the bees. That doesn't count. Anyway, this is called Feeding Decisions about, uh, Under Contamination Risk in Bonobos in the Philosophical Transition, Transactions of the Royal Society of Medicine. <laughs> and they were curious, will bonobos avoid bananas another sleep study. if they are, in, are presented to them in association with feces oh. or dirt? Will, will bonobos avoid food, avoid food if they're presented in association with feces or dirt? Will they? They will. <laughs> 
<laughs> they're very good at it. And wow. I wish you could see the graph. I wish I could. People online. But they have this lovely experiment where they have sliced bananas further and further away from the banana, which is on top of the, the feces. And the, this is the six, <laughs> and, and the likelihood that they will eat the banana goes up in a linear, linear relationship function, to the distance from the feces. increasing function of <laughs> decreased feces. Oh, no. So the question is whether, whether bonomos would avoid food that are closer to the horrible thing, and the answer is yes. Wow. Okay. So now we know that. So now we know. Yeah, there's a whole lot else about bonobos that we are not allowed to discuss. <laughs> there's absolutely podcast. true. I think we could have a special right. edition of the podcast about bonobos. I and think we could. bananas and poo. <laughs> Poo, All right. Uh, very once quickly, again, we have an episode about poo and pee. Right, and about I'm going to and I'm going to add to that. <laughs> Go. All right. So um, what I wanted to do was to um, report very quickly on two papers. One. No, one. No, no, two. But two. I'll do put them together. Yes. So very two. quick. One paper which establishes the fact that when you have a full bla bladder. It has deleterious effects on your cognitive abilities. That is so true. true. But it improves your judgment. What? Because yes. you're thinking strategically about got to find the bathroom. So, so there, was, there was one study that was in neurology and urodynamics, which, yep. is, a, which is a journal I've never heard of. Oh, yeah, no, no. What is a urodynamic? The, the, now, is they, that, a, is that something to do with the, the European Union? Wait, 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 wait. You said the BMJ is not a bathroom what rag, did Medical, you say? Uh, yes, one clearly would be. Are you done? Go ahead. I'm done. Go ahead. The effect of acute increase in urge to void on cognitive function in healthy adults. So they had 15 healthy volunteers. They um, said that they needed my, to, my to drink 200 milliliters of water continuously without being able to go to the bathroom. And they were given cognitive tests. They have, and, um, wait, wait, wait. They have, all, they have on, reality TV shows the, like all, this. All along the, the way. And they, they gave do. the test at baseline. Um, at the point at which there is an increase in an ur in urge to micturate, which is the term that they use. Mixturate? Um, and then they, they did it again when there was a strong urge, and then they did it again when there was an extreme urge. And uh, predictably, people's level of cognitive functioning fell off precipitously, especially in the extreme <laughs> urge category. Now, that So it, it, it's, it's deleterious? Like the, the, the stronger the you urge, the more you cannot You cannot think straight when you have to go to the bathroom. Right. I thought yeah, it was yeah, it's like curve. proving the self-evident, huh? Obviously. I mean, but there was another there was another paper that was published in uh, Psychological Science in May of 2011. This actually made this, this won an Ig Nobel Award in 2015. Inhibitory spillover, increased urination urgency facilitates impulse control in unrelated domains. By Mirjam took Deborah Tamp. Tampi from the Norwegian School of Management, and basically what they did is a series of experiments where they found that people who were, whose bladder was full and were repressing the urge, the impulse to urinate, were functioning better on tests. The one thing that they, the, the one test that they looked at was something called a Stroop test, a Stroop? where, where they now? gave them a a, a page of um, words that corresponded to colors, but the font was not the color of the word being described. So green would be red, <laughs> yellow would be blue, and they would then have to very quickly tell you what was the actual color of the letters. And they did better on that test when their bladders were full than if their bladders weren't full. So the reasoning being that the urge to maintain the inhibition because uh, of, of urination because your bladder is full somehow potentiates your ability to be able to um, work through that task. They were also asked um, sort of hypothetical questions like, would you prefer $13 today or $30 in a week? And that kind of yeah. deferred gratification was potentiated by a full bladder. You want the $13 really? now if you've got to pee. Correct. Yeah. Huh. Because I can use that $13 to buy something at a store and then use their bathroom. That's right. Yep. <laughs> I'm totally in on that one. Wow. So uh, this, the p-value is very significant is on very this low. paper. Wow. All right. Well, that's uh, exciting. So that I, changes everything. I did not go with a study for this one. I went with uh, somebody's CV. So Chris, you're a complete failure, right? <laughs> yeah, apparently. Yeah. So I think you're going to like this. So do you document all of your failures? Uh, I've published them, in fact. Oh, well done. Well done. So this, this is not new, this goes back to 2016, but there was a uh, professor at Princeton, a psychology professor named uh, Johannes Haushofer, and he published, in addition to his regular CV, he published a CV of his failures. 
So he put together a CV listing <laughs> all the negative things that he had done in his career. Which one was longer? Scientific or just non-specific? Scientific. Like relationship educational. failures? No, it didn't have really, I, we could write in request more. So, so I'll give you the categories. I would be thinking high school would be a couple volumes for me. Oh, yeah, we don't need to know about that. Uh, so the categories include degree programs I did not get into, <laughs> academic positions and fellowships I did not get, <laughs> awards and scholarships I did not get, paper rejections from academic journals, and research funding I did not get. And then it ends with my favorite, which is the meta failures, which is that in 2016, he lists, this darn CV of failures has received way more attention than any, than my entire body of academic work. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was fantastic. That's a success. It does, of course, raise some important questions about who can publish a CV of their failures. I would assume you have to probably be pretty successful to actually publish your CV full of failures, but still, you I probably publish it. it in the Journal of Irreproducible Results. Like, we have an, an author in our presence. Yes, who has well done, there. Chris. Thank Good you. for you. All right, well, that's it. So that's the end of our program. If you've got any feedback on this or any other episode or you want to suggest a study or a topic for us to take on, you can tweet us at at PopHealthyX, or you can tweet me at at ProfMattFox, or you can tweet Chris at at ID.Gill, or Don at, at dthea1 if his account is unblocked yet. <laughs> or you can find us on the Population Health Exchange website at www.pophealthyx.org. We want to thank Leslie Talalian, Director of Lifelong Learning at BU School of Public Health for supporting the podcast, and Nick Guler for sound and editing. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope you will download our next episode. And all the PHXers in the audience, thank you. Welcome to thank the BU. Thank you.